today we're looking at the five faculties for effective prayer, and we're looking at faith as one of those faculties. Last week we looked at imagination. And imagination and faith actually work together. I'll talk about that a little bit today. <clears throat> but um, I call these executive faculties, as I have said, because we have a choice as to how we use them. We all exercise faith all the time. There's never a moment when we're not having faith in something. It may not be in the best thing in the world that we have our faith in, but uh, we still have faith, and it's the same faculty that um, the whole idea is to be become aware of how we're using these faculties. And imagination, of course, is one that is um, one of the most difficult probably to harness or to, um, to reel in. Because it's so easy for the mind to shoot off in whatever direction, you know, that uh, it want, seems to want to go. It's a little bit like a spoiled child that doesn't know anything about discipline, and we're having to discipline it. We're having to bring it back into uh, a place that is that works for us rather than against us. So we are... Yeah, wouldn't work for a second. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about faith and belief. Faith is often used to describe a system of belief. We usually use it to generalize in a, in a generalized manner, assuming we know something of a person's faith if we know what religious de denomination they subscribe to. This may tell us something of the religious tenets they subscribe to, but it tells us nothing about how they engage their faculty of faith. And you can ask the question, what faith is such and such a person, and you'll think what religious uh, uh, denomination they, they adhere to. So we use faith in a kind of a loose way. And that, of course, implies that if you're involved in a religious denomination that you have faith, meaning you believe in God and believe in the tenets that uh, are put forth in that particular religion. But we don't want to make that, uh, make that confusion because you can... You can be involved in a religious denomination, you can be involved in a belief system and still have faith in the negative, still have faith in that things aren't going to work out for your life or things uh, in a particular situation. What you subscribe to in a uh, religious system has nothing to do with how you're using your faculty of faith, is what I'm trying to say. So we don't want to confuse those things. You, you can't say, for example, I was baptized in the Baptist church, and so I'm saved. You know, I have, uh, my faith is in God, and my faith is that I'm saved. But are you saved in the moment that you're living your life at this, you know, right now? Or are you terrified that something bad is going to happen? Where's your faith right now? It's not what church do you belong to, it's how are you using the faculty of your faith? So we want to make that distinction. Faith is an organic aspect of our consciousness. It's something we are using all the time. And um, so that's what we want to focus on. <clears throat> belief and faith are not synonymous. We can say we believe a certain way, but on closer examination, we discover that we really don't have faith in what we profess to believe. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to point any fingers because I would point them at myself as well. If I pointed at you, I'd have three pointing back at myself. But we open our, our uh, uh, service with there's but one presence, one power, God the good, omnipotent. And that's, that's a foundation of our belief system. We start with that idea there's only one presence, one power working out in my life and in the universe, in the whole world. So we say that, then we go home and we turn on the news and see that it looks like the world's going to hell in a handbasket. <laughs> do we still believe that? How do we reconcile that there's one presence, one power, that one presence, one power of good working out through all things? Can we hold that or do we fall down? Do we suddenly turn our faith in the appearance that we're looking at and lose our faith and wonder where in the world the world is headed? So it takes some thought, it takes some, because the mind flashes so quickly and 
whatever direction that it happens to go, that's what we need to look at. But belief is an intellectual construct. When we make an affirmation like there's only one presence and one power in my life, in the universe, in the church, and whatever, uh, and that power is God, the good, that's a, an intellectual idea. So my challenge then is to make that an experience, to bring that into my level of understanding where that becomes an experience. Faith is expectation at the gut level. I have always said faith is synonymous with expectation, but if you think of it, faith is expectation at the gut level. You can tell where your faith is if you look at your gut, if you see how your stomach feels. Uh, if it's all tight and you're concerned, you're worried about something, your faith is in whatever the thing is you're worried about. And again, I'm speaking to all of us. This is a, a good um, way to think about it. When you think about your own life, you think about the world, you think about your, the situation that you might be in at this time, how do you feel at the gut level? You know, that's, that's where your faith is. And if you find that you're tight, that you uh, live in fear, that things aren't going to work out for, for your highest good, then what do we do about that? How do we get our faith turned around? And one of the first things we do is acknowledge where we are with it. And it's not a matter of saying there's not <clears throat> bad things going on out there in the world. There's not people doing some, some nasty things because there are. It's not sticking our head in the sand. But it's how we're dealing with things. Um, when Jesus was up on the mountain, the mountain, uh, had the transfiguration experience. They came down from the mountain and they found that the disciples and several people were all engaged in, a, in an argument. And what had happened is a man with a, an epileptic son had brought the son to the disciples, actually to Jesus, and he wasn't there, but uh, they asked the disciples if, if uh, they could heal the boy, and they couldn't. They were not able to do that. So Jesus, they called him over and he went and asked how long the boy had been, had this problem. And he said, since childhood. So that was probably the appearance the disciples were going on, that this is a, was a lifetime thing and we don't have much power over this. So Jesus, to make a long story short, cast out the problem. The boy was healed. And the disciples asked him later, how come we couldn't do that? And he said, this type of thing requires much prayer. So the thought there is there can be some pretty dramatic appearances that just blow us away, that uh, cause our faith to, to say, you know, no greater good is unfolding through this. How could it? And so what we have to do is step back. And if we understand what we mean by omnipotence, there's only one presence, one power, and that is God the good, that means that the one reality is God. That yes, there are appearances of something less, but the uh, message Jesus said that this requires more prayer is to step back and say, okay, here's how it looks, but beneath this is a greater good of some kind that is now unfolding through this situation. And that is what would set a person like Jesus apart from the disciples because they were actually able to heal. They had several healing uh, episodes later on in their career after he was gone, actually. And he said that he had to go away so they would be able to do that. Stop looking at him. But uh, sometimes we have to step back and say, OK, I don't understand what's going on here, but this greater good is now unfolding through me, through this situation, and get to the point where you can actually have faith in that statement, in that truth, because that is happening. So many times things happen that look like they're negative, and some greater good comes out of it. And I'm going to give some examples here in just a second. But faith can manifest as peace of mind or as stress. If you're stressed out, you've got faith in something but it's pointed in a negative direction. 
So that's, uh, you don't say, I need more faith, because if you had more faith, you'd probably be more stressed out. <laughs> you need to redirect your faith. That's what we need to, to uh, remind ourselves. I have all the faith I need, but where is it pointed? We experience peace when our expectation is focused on greater good unfolding. Stress is the effect of expecting the worst. We do ourselves a favor when we get in touch with our expectation at the gut level. And that's kind of a basic way to say it, but it's true. Then we can re redirect our faith in a way that is conducive to the peace we desire. <clears throat> and we know that we're redirecting our faith when our physical being begins to relax, when we relax our body. That we feel, I don't know how this is going to work out, but I know it is in some way. The greater good is now unfolding. You're going to wonder what this is all about. Antikythera mechanism. How many of you have heard of this? Nobody? This is the world's first computer. And it's about, it's over 2,000 years old, and it doesn't look like much. But this is a device that was discovered near the island of Antikythera. I had to really practice on saying it. How, how many of you can say that? Let's say it three times. <laughs> Antikythera. It's uh, in the Greek islands. There was a group of sponge divers back in 1900, 1901, I think. Uh, same year my grandfather on my mother's side was born. They were out headed to the uh, sponge fields, I guess, and they got hit by a storm by Antikythera, uh, the island. And it's a small island, very small, just a tiny dot. They say there's about 30 inhabit inhabitants on it today and an, about uh, 80 goats. So it's not, uh, there's no gas stations, no uh, internet, no nothing there. But it's, uh, anyway, the sponge fishermen got to that point and they got hit by a very bad storm and it lasted for three days so they had to anchor there in their little boat and um, back then when they were diving they wore those metal brass helmets you know in the diving suits and people had to pump pump air into the suit they decided while they were there at Antikythera that they would check out the uh, the bottom to see if there were any sponges there so a diver went down he was a young man and uh, came up he jerked on the rope and they pulled him up and he was uh, just totally distraught. He said, there's nothing but dead bodies down here, arms, legs, horses, all kinds of things. And so the captain of the, of the boat decided he'd better go down and check it out. Well, he went down and what the young man saw was a bunch of statues and uh, bronze statues, marble statues that turned out to be from a shipwreck uh, from a Roman ship that uh, wrecked there uh, some 2,000 years ago. Um, and it probably had about 300 passengers on it also. The uh, boat that they think it was was a grain boat, it's one of the biggest boats that uh, they used to sail back then. They would get grain, but they also, to increase the revenue, would made a very luxurious um, area for about 300 very well-heeled passengers. So this boat apparently went down at, uh, way back then. So they s went back to the site and they started pulling things up uh, under the, uh, with the okay of the Greek uh, government, started pulling things up and this was a lump that looks just about like it does there. Nobody knew what it was. They set it aside to examine it later and um, then they, it kind of fell apart and they saw there were these gears, these wheels in it. And <clears throat> what they discovered, uh, scientists have kind of re-put it together today. But what it is, it's a computer that when you turn this side crank over on the, on the right side, on the, the left uh, image there, that... <clears throat> You can predict up to 500 years, you know, what the planets and what eclipses and all that thing, that stuff is going to be. 
but they're, they think the, the ultimate machine had something like 50 some gears in it. And this is not something that scientists thought was even possible for that time, that period that something like this could be, could be uh, put together. But the point I'm making here is that something bad happened, and that was a storm. And from that storm came one of the, what they call one of the greatest archaeological discoveries ever. That uh, Go on YouTube and just type in uh, ancient Greek computer. And you'll find this thing. You'll find several presentations. Nova has done a very good job of doing it. There was a mathematician that kind of broke the codes uh, fairly recently, and he, he gives a lecture. It's all very interesting stuff. But the point is, if, if there had not been adversity, there would not be something like this have, having been discovered. And they are calling it the first computer you know, in, in, in the world. But when you... Listen to how they say it operates. That 2,000 years ago, somebody built this thing. They think they know who it was, but um, not absolutely sure. <clears throat> but they would have to hand make all of these, all of these gears, and the wheels uh, represent. There has to be a number, the correct number of notches to make it work properly to show the future eclipses and show where the planets are going to be, and it shows the moon. It spins around and shows what phases it will be in, and it's just totally remarkable how anybody could come up with something like that, even today. It's, it would be a pretty phenomenal thing. But this is 2,000 years ago, and um, this discovery would not have been made if the ship had survived and the uh, artifact had also survived, they say it was pretty uh, likely that it would have sometime been melted down. They hope they can find another one like it or something like it, you know, to just kind of confirm everything. But uh, one that's intact, that's not at the bottom of the sea someplace. But the, the thing is, <clears throat> something that was not real positive, that was life-threatening, and of course, it wasn't positive at all to the people on the on the ship. But to the sponge fishermen, they found something they weren't looking for. They found something that uh, was much greater, and they didn't even know what it was at first. Nobody knew what it was. It sat in uh, the museum over in Athens for quite a while, and that's where it is right now, if you ever get over there and want to see it. See, an Antikythera mechanism is what it's called. There are other things, other examples. There are four people I want to call your attention to, and I have before. One is Nancy Rines. She is a person that described herself as the atheist from Boulder. She was a scientist who was riding her bicycle one day and got hit by an SUV and momentarily died and had the most incredible experience of her life, totally changed her life, and you can tell when somebody changes because they go from atheist to absolute believer. It's not even a question. And um, it's like Paul on the road to Damascus. You know something happened to him because he was persecuting Christians for a living, for a hobby or whatever he was doing it for, and had this vision, and he stopped doing it. He turned into one of the most faithful, uh, phenomenal disciples of all. Uh, if it wasn't for Paul, we probably would not have a Christian movement. But <clears throat> anyway, this woman ended up saying that that was the most incredible experience she ever had in her life, the most life-changing thing. What a negative thing to be drug under an SUV for about 50 feet, you know, and be pronounced dead and then come back, you know, through the healing process. Another one is Anita Morjoni, who died of cancer, lymph lymphoma cancer, and she... Uh, went on for a very long time. Uh, there was not any hope of her survival, but she did survive. She had a near-death experience, came back. She's speaking all over the world now. All of these people are. Eben Alexander, the neurosurgeon, who his brain turned to mush with the uh, disease that suddenly came upon him one morning. 
he realized he had and went into a coma for, I think it was seven days or something. He had a near-death experience. Came back, and he is now, again, traveling all over the world. You'll find him all over, the, all over YouTube. And George Ritchie, who kind of started this way back, I think, in the 40s, and I, he spoke here many years ago, I guess, George Ritchie, had a near-death experience. He was a medical student. He died. The One of the uh, nurses talked the doctor into shooting uh, adrenaline directly into his heart and bringing him back. But he was dead for ten min or nine minutes, I think it was. Had this incredible experience. The point is, you, you can't think of a more negative experience any of these people could have had. But it ended up changing their lives. And every single one of them have said, I wouldn't trade it for anything, you know, the, the result of that. So what happened is their faith faculty was turned in a direction where before it all would have seemed very negative. Who wants to be drug under an SUV? Who wants to have their brain turned to mush? Who wants to develop cancer and be pronounced dead? Who wants to, uh, you know, die of cardiac arrest on the surgeon's table? Nobody does. But when something like that happens and people come out of it, you know, we say that is the worst thing that could possibly happen. Well, it's the best thing that could have happened. So if we take every situation that we're involved in that looks like it's a, a death sentence or an attack on our peace of mind or an attack on the quality of our life, if we will back off a little bit and think, well, maybe this is the best thing that could ever happen to me. Maybe this is the best thing. Uh, when I was in my late 20s, I've shared, or mid 20s, I guess, um, early 20s, maybe, I don't know. I was in my 20s. But I had this uh, spiritual experience. I was very depressed at the time I had it, and I've shared, in all my books, I've shared this story and shared it with you many times. But I was getting ready for bed at night, and my mind suddenly opened in a way that I can't describe. It was uh, the most beautiful experience I've ever had. And I heard a voice, I, it was not audible, but I knew what it was saying. It said, do not be concerned about your life, there's a plan. And that's all it said, that's all that I, the message I got. And it was just, tears were just streaming down my face. It was just such a beautiful, absolute uh, love. You know, I just, I, there's no words to describe it. That's why I'm drawn to the near-death experiences, because they, what they're describing is what I've experienced. I didn't have a near-death experience, but it was, it was a, uh, a mystical awareness, awakening. And that's why I got in this, this field. And so the other day I was thinking about that, and I was kind of trying to get the attention of that voice that said that to me, and I said, you said there's a plan and I'm looking at my church, you know, that's uh, gone down quite a bit. And I'm saying, well, <laughs> duh, what is the plan? And the feeling I got is, well, this is the plan. This is all part of the plan. It's all part of your experience. When I was in ministerial school, I was, uh, became good friends with the dean of the school. Uh, he was kind of a mentor. Paul Barrett, Dr. Paul Barrett. And <clears throat> I was in his office one day, we were talking, he said, you know, and I'm a student, you know, he's, he's the dean, and he said, you know, some of the, the best ministers are in their worst places, that is, they go out to the, the cushy churches, you know, the ones that are the uh, up and running well and financially prosperous and all this. He said, the best Ministers need to be in the most struggling churches, the ones that need help most. And I've carried that all these, you know, 40 some years that he said that. And uh, I understand what he's talking about, what he was talking about then. That we are faced with things because all through my career, we would judge the success of a minister by the size of their church. I would do that. Everybody would do that. You go to conferences, everybody's bragging about how big their church is, how exciting it is. Well, I can't do that right now. And, um, and I feel okay with that. It's okay that it's 
come to this point. I don't know where it's going, but <clears throat> this is part of the plan. And part of the plan is for me to look at myself. Is my worth tied to the size of my church? Because if it is, I'm not worth much. You know, our church is not big. It's good. We've got great people here. But it's, uh, when you think in those terms, it's a whole different place. It's a whole different mindset. And so I've concluded that you do have the best minister in unity in your church right now. <laughs> because I doubt if there's too many this small. <clears throat> but, um, and it's kind of interesting. We're not really struggling. We're just, it's an, it could be an ego buster if I would let it. But this is part of the plan. I mean, that's the message I got. So it's okay. It's okay to be here. It could be the, this could be the very best time in my ministerial career for my spiritual quest, for my spiritual understanding of myself. Because if you are equating yourself with what you have, then you're missing the point. It's what you are that matters. That's what it's all about. So where's your faith? Is it in the size of your church? Is it in the way your life is working or not working? Does your life not look like it's, you think it's supposed to? Well, maybe it's not supposed to look that way because it's trying to get your attention. Maybe there's another way to look at yourself and another way to look at your life. But I am struck by the fact that so much uh, good comes out of turmoil. So much good comes out of challenge. Some of the greatest people that we know, they're great because they survived or led people through some challenging time in history. Otherwise, we wouldn't know who they are. If, if these four people I just mentioned had not died and had horrible experiences, we wouldn't even have ever heard of them. They'd never written books about it. They never, we wouldn't know who they are. If these fishermen had not had a, a bad day on the ocean, we would never know what this machine was. I would encourage you to, to watch the, uh, the, especially the Nova series on this thing because it's, it's, it's just totally fascinating uh, if you haven't heard of, of it. I had heard of it, but it was just kind of floating around in the back of my mind. I couldn't pronounce it, first of all, so I didn't know how to look it up. But uh, I ran into it the other day, and uh, it's just a fascinating story. So the faculties of faith and imagination work closely together. Jesus advised that we lift our eyes and see the field already white for harvest. He's referring to the mind's eye, the imagination. Faith is the, expect, the expectation of reaping this imagined harvest. So look at what picture you're holding in your, in your mind of whatever it is you're going through and kind of drop down to that gut level and see how you're applying your, your faith, your expectation. Where is it? Let the picture be what it is. Don't try to change it. Just let it be. But <clears throat> don't let it be the last frame in the movie. You know, let it be one clip out of the whole movie. The movie's running. You know, this is your life. It's running and it's unfolding in ways that you may not understand at this moment. I doubt if any of these people that had their near-death experience could understand while it was happening what was going on. It's often as we get to the other side that we see what we've been through, that we understand why those messages, uh, those, uh, that input was there. It gets our attention in ways that we'd just, we would never uh, choose to do. So whatever challenge you may have in your life, get the feeling that it has already reached a successful conclusion. On one level, it may appear that there are four months to harvest, but turn the outcome. We don't have to see how it's going to ultimately turn out because we probably can't. We probably won't see that. But <clears throat> the imagination is not just the picturing of the mind. It's, it's the feeling. It's connected to faith. It's how you feel about something. Imagination is visualization, but it's, it's feeling as well. Those two things working together. And it's very important to to hold that. And if you find yourself lying awake at night thinking about something that's uh, bothering you, just look at what you're doing. You have faith and you're exercising your faith, but what picture are you exercising your faith in? 
and begin to just let that dissolve, let that change, let that go until you begin to relax and feel uh, more of a sense of peace in yourself. It's not easy to do, but I say all the time, it's a lot easier than not doing it because you go through that stressful time that'll keep you awake all night. That's not too easy because you get up the next day and your, your day's kind of ruined if you don't get a good night's sleep. Jesus also advised that when we pray, we should go into our room and shut the door and pray to the Father or pray in secret. It is best to keep your prayer work to yourself. Hold the highest vision concerning your situation and then expect that vision to come forth, either in a way you see it or in some better way. If we focus only on the opening of a specific door, we may not notice the other door that now stands open. And I have a bit of a disadvantage sharing with you some personal things I go through. I don't share everything with you, but I think it's a very good idea to keep to yourself whatever it is you're working on uh, with your own faith, your own imagination, your own how you're using your, your, uh, this, this great prayer tool that we have at our disposal to keep that to yourself and uh, as much as possible and just know that things are working out. Okay? That's part two. We'll get to part three next week in the, uh, the five-part series on prayer. Thanks for coming. Well, I headed to the open land Had horizons with the need to expand There were rivers to cross In the darkness of the valley below I got lost out in a lonely night Made a left when I should have turned right But I'm not looking back That was too many rivers ago I've encountered people on the road Who labor hard with some emotional load Hanging on to their pain they cannot let the spirit flow But the breaking of a better day Is a choice to find another way And letting go of the past That was too many rivers ago It will free you from the chains of fear The light that seems so distant Now becomes abundantly clear From the shadows you will come You will be marching to a different drum will awaken to the truth of all you can become in the silence you will go you will seek until you know you are unshackled from the life that was too many rivers ago
free you from the chains of fear The light that seems so distant now becomes abundantly clear From the shadows you will come You will be marching to a different drum You will awaken to the truth of all you can be In the silence you will go You will seek until you know You are unshackled from the life that was too many rivers ago When you're longing for what might have been Instead of looking within With your mind in the ruins You cannot let your vision grow If you want to open up the way Look across those darker valleys and say I'm moving on with my life That was too was too many rivers ago I'm moving on with my life that was too many rivers ago You've been watching a talk given by Reverend Doug Bator here at Independent Unity in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us spread our message. If you would like to support us, you can do so by clicking the button in the right-hand corner of the video screen. We greatly appreciate your support. Thanks again for watching.